Just a quick reminder, as we are taping, if you could take your cell phones and turn them to the ringer off, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. All right, good morning. Good morning. Ah, very good. Everybody's had a good breakfast, I hope. Um, we want you to get used to talking. This is going to be somewhat of an interactive discussion today, so we want tough questions. We want this to be a very uh, useful seminar when we are done. My name is Wendy May. My paying job is as a trial attorney, but my job of significance, the job that allows me to work toward and to see true generational change is as board chair for iCivics. iCivics, along with the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University, the Campaign for Civic Missions of Schools, the Lou Frey Center at the University of Central Florida, and PACE funders, all thank you for coming. And we are delighted that you could join us today for this groundbreaking summit. Democracy at a crossroads. Our, nation's needs, our nation needs innovative civic learning now. This event is generously sponsored both with financial resources and truly manpower hours by Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Robert McCormick Foundation, and the Hewlett Foundation. Their recognition of the immediate need for intervention and their willingness to support this mission makes real change possible. We are deeply grateful for their significant assistance. I hope each of you in this room, we truly hope each of you in this room today, Will, be equal, will leave here equally committed to seizing this unparalleled opportunity that we have right now for real change if we do this together. The sad reality is we're here today because there is an objectively recognized civic crisis going on. There's intense polarization. There's deep distrust. There's incivility. There's uninformed positioning. And there's general just disinterest in engagement at all, all with critical consequences to our society. And I call it objective because this truly is a bipartisan recognition. It's been lamented by politicians on both sides, professors, judges, musicians, actors, athletes, and students alike, and certainly our teachers. For years, honestly, iCivics has been the ugly stepsister of the education world, but now, is really our time. I believe after today, you will agree that the current focus on this crisis gives us momentum for change now. You will also recognize the verifiable link between improved civic learning and increased responsible civic engagement. And most importantly, you will understand the solution to improve civic learning that leads to engagement is now available. It is effective, it is affordable, and it is in demand. The necessity of innovation and state initiatives is part of the solution. To effectuate change has, in fact, been evaluated and documented. I am pleased to invite Peter Levine to the stage to share an exciting announcement. Thanks, Wendy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Peter Levine from the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University, which is the only college in the nation entirely devoted to teaching, studying, and advocating civics. And I have been asked to announce the release of the new white paper, A Republic Still at Risk, um, which is in your packets. Uh, the, my co-author for that paper is Dr. Kay Kawashima Ginsburg from Circle at Tufts, um, and many other people contributed to writing it. It builds on and updates two uh, reports about civics that represented consensus largely in the field, The Civic Mission of Schools, 2003, and Guardian of Democracy, 2011. It talks about best practices for civic learning and includes never previously released evaluation data about progress we're making in Florida. We'll be discussing these new data and the recommendations throughout the summit. Again, you can read the report. Um, it's in your conference materials. It's online as well. I'm very excited that we were able to present this research to add to the conversation today. And I'd like to join Wendy in thanking Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Hewlett and Robert R. McCormick Foundations for their support, both financial but also intellectual. Thank you. Back to you. As Peter mentioned, 
<clears throat> excuse me, that research paper is in your packet, please read it. It, it, is, it is the metrics that is driving the change as we go forward. <clears throat> the opportunity today to bring together the great thinkers and doers that we have in this room in civic education is largely the brainchild of Dr. Vartan Gregorian. Dr. Gregorian is a well-known historian and the visionary behind the Carnegie Corporation's philanthropic mission. He has led renowned institutions such as Brown University and the New York Public Library. Though an immigrant to this country, he is the example of civic engagement. He has received numerous awards, including the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, the National Humanities Medal, and the nation's highest civic award, the Medal of Freedom. Please help me welcome Dr. Gregorian to the stage. Good morning and welcome, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and privilege to be with you here at this wonderful museum for this most important national gathering. Carnegie Corporation of New York is honored to partner with our sister institutions, the Hewlett and McCormick Foundations, in support of this conference. As you know, the lead organization hosting today's event is iCivics. So far, is the largest civic education provider in the nation. Founded by incomparable Justice Sandra O'Connor, one of my heroes and friends. Today's meeting comes at, on the heels of Constitution Day, which is not mentioned in any of the documents, September 17, the day US Constitution was ratified in Philadelphia in 1787. Through this indispensable document, the Founding Fathers established a republic in order to, as they wrote, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. One of them also said, we give you a republic if you can keep it. Constitution Day gave yet another opportunity to reflect on the purpose of today's conference, namely on the status of history and civic education in our country, as well as on the state of our democratic institutions. I was, I'm afraid to say, disheartened. On September 17. Current studies indicate that great many of us know little about our nation's history and our government. In a survey conducted by Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, only a quarter of participants could name all three branches of our government, and nearly one third failed to name even one branch. The survey also indicated that more than a third of participants were unable to name any of the rights guaranteed under the First Amendment. It is sad, indeed, that we as a nation preach democracy to the world, and yet so many of us are unaware of the very foundations of our own democratic society. It's not only knowledge that Americans may lack, but also the spirit and the faith in our government and our political wisdom of our electorate. A recent survey of the Pew Research Center indicated that only a third of Americans have trust and confidence in the political wisdom of the American people. At a time when our nation is so divided and so-called fake news is rampant, promoting knowledge of our history and the foundation of our society has never been more imperative. I'm not talking about the letter of our constitution, the letter of our laws, I'm talking spirit of democracy. True citizenship requires not only an understanding of how our government functions, but also knowledge of our collective past. It requires knowledge of our rights as guaranteed by our constitution, as well as knowledge of our duties and obligations as citizen. In short, being good citizen requires effort and reflection. As citizens, we must cultivate our common ground and common destiny. The political theorist Hannah Arendt put it in co so cogently when she said that there is no safety in liberty without a sense of citizenship. It is the con concept and the essence of citizenship that transformed the social contract into a moral transaction. It's the essence of citizenship that ties our pluralistic society. As Americans, 
we cannot retreat from the big issues of our society and our time to what Reverend William Sloan Coffin said, pygmy world of private piety. To paraphrase one of my illustrious predecessors at Carnegie Corporation, John W. Gardner, when it comes to our democracy, he said, we must be loving critics and critical lovers, but never indifferent. In this age of internet, any individual has potential of having access to computer and smartphone, their own library if they don't have it. All of this time, each one of you, each one of us, have our own library of Alexandria. Imagine that, entire knowledge of the world in our fingertips for the first time since Pharaoh's established Library of Alexandria. This in theory should mean that we live in the new age of enlightenment. Several weeks ago, I was talking to an audience and I showed this. I said, this is iPhone. Entire Greek literature is here. Are you impressed? But you still have to read it. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, you're in storage business rather than knowledge business. In the age of enlightenment, knowledge built on an understanding of the past informs the future. However, today we are instead become prisoners of the present. For a society without the deep historical memory, the future ceases to exist and the present becomes meaningless cacophony. Many factors are to blame for the decline of civic understanding in our nation. That includes our fractious K-12 education system. As an educator and president of Carnegie Corporation of New York, a major support of educational reform, this has been a great concern of ours for many, many years, and many other foundations, and even governments. I remember well in 1983, report A Nation at Risk, the product of President Reagan's National Commission on Excellence in Education. It warned, and I quote, the educational foundation of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation, as a people. It also stated that if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre education system that we have today, we might well have considered this as an act of war. Since these words were written more than 30 years ago, strides have been made in the struggle for high quality, equitable education in America. Yet globally, United States today continues to rank far below many of our peer, peers in the world when it comes to educational achievement, both undergrad, K-12, K- K- and even higher education. I firmly believe that if we fall, fail in pr- to improve the quality of our nation's K-12 education system for all students, it augurs ill for the future of our society. Inequitable, <coughs> mediocre education will continue to accelerate class divisions and lead to the decline of our nation's faith in our democracy and its current position as a major political and economic power in the world. This concern, of course, applies to higher education as well. U.S. colleges and universities represent our nation's aspirations, yet many have become and increasingly becoming only utilitarian, market-oriented enterprises. These institutions have become what I call higher education, H-I-R-E, education. In the process, they have forgotten their obligation to provide not just skilled workforce, but well-educated citizens also. Uh, The ones who know and understand our system, our society, our government, and our place in the world. Carnegie Corporation founder, Andrew Carnegie, believed in the fundamental importance of a strong education system to guarantee our country's future. The lessons of our nation's history must be central part of our education, both elementary, secondary, at post-secondary levels. This lesson should include America's accomplishments, its culture, science, technology, its triumphs, its tragedies, its glories, the American Revolution, 
world wars, the civil rights movement, as well as tragedies and infamies, civil war and slavery, the trail of tears, this infringement of women and minorities. After all, as Martin Luther King said, we are not makers of history, we are made by history. That is why well-informed society is so vital. To quote another great American, 200 years ago, James Madison wrote, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce of tra tra tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and people who mean uh, to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. More than ever, we need today knowledge to protect us against would-be demagogues and other destructive forces that our founding fathers warned us against. More than ever, we need knowledge of our society and its institutions of rights and obligations. More than ever, we need civic education to be an integral part of both K-12 and higher education. We need all this because America, I believe, while not perfect, I always believe it's always perfectible. We must arm ourselves and each with knowledge of our origins in order to debate them honestly and effectively and in order to continue to work towards a more perfect union. Thank you and good luck.